Welcome back everyone, it's me Matt, thank you so much for joining me on today's video talking about the U2 Dragon Lady spy plane. Many of you have asked for me to look at this wonderful beauty that flies through the skies and almost space for quite some time and a development of the Skunk Works program. We're going to learn a little bit about how this spy plane came to be. Now the U-2 spy plane became the first operational aircraft in 1956 under a spy program that was extremely, extremely important for the United States at the time under the CIA and the U-2 Air Force Operations Program began the following year after 1956. In 1960, the U-2 pilot Francis Gary Powers was shot down while taking photographs over the Soviet Union, sparking a huge international incident. In 1962, U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson unveiled the U-2 images at the United Nations to prove Soviets had installed missiles in Cuba. Some in the United States Air Force call it the useless deuce, yet the U-2 became one of the most important aircraft ever to fly, and as mentioned, technically the U-2 did keep us out of World War III. Six decades later, updated U-2 planes, part of a 30-plane fleet now flown by the U.S. Air Force pilots, conduct combat missions over Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, as well as performing humanitarian surveillance, which is kind of strange. You wouldn't think it would, but the amount of information and surveillance that this thing can perform is actually helping to do more than just military application. The planes brought back images, actually, of floodwaters unleashed by Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2005 and the damage caused by the 2010 Haiti earthquake. The nickname Dragon Lady comes from a female character in the 1940s cartoon strip Terry and the Pirates. United States Air Force pilots saw the parallels between her unpredictable behavior and the U-2's flying characteristics and the name was appropriated for her. A hastily designed stopgap, in all purposes, was this aircraft. It was intended to fly for two or perhaps four years at most. Its fragility and really difficult way of flying really caused some major issues for pilots wanting to fly it, and it has killed quite a few of them at an unprecedented rate. The airplane was so difficult to land that it's basically an absolute nightmare to get this thing on the ground without having a whole host of other people, other vehicles, and infrastructure to get it on the ground. The U-2 program originated with a national requirement, an unsolicited proposal and studies championed by a panel of notable scientists tasked with advising President Dwight D. Eisenhower on how the nation might defend itself against the threat of a surprise Soviet nuclear attack. To do this required as much intelligence as possible on Soviet capabilities, but the Russian-dominated USSR was a closed society and was virtually inaccessible to the outside world. This was advocated and developed for a new reconnaissance air force aircraft for the United States and was to be actually operated by both the CIA and the Air Force together. The aircraft, already under development by Lockheed Aircraft Company, was described as essentially a powered glider. It would accommodate a single pilot and require a range of 3,000 nautical miles. It would carry a camera capable of resolving objects as small as an individual person. To ensure survivability against Soviet surface-to-air missiles, the airplane would need to attain altitudes above 70,000 feet. Such a platform that could actually provide these sort of capabilities and look for locations of military and industrial installations allowed for more accurate assessments of the Soviet order of battle and also allowed estimates of how the Soviet ability to produce and deliver the obvious nuclear weapons threat of the Cold War. It was thought the U-2 could actually fly higher than Soviet radar to track it. 
How could this be though, since the U-2 would be flying just 13 miles up, certainly within range of even the most primitive radars? But surveillance radar points at the horizon, not straight up. And the CIA figured that the top of its sweep was about 11 degrees above horizontal. 60 miles out, coverage was around 5,000 feet of altitude per degree, or 55,000 feet. And the closer an airplane got to the radar station, the more that that ceiling lowered. Unfortunately for the United States, the Soviets were improving their radar technology faster than anticipated, however. At least in part by using captured German technology. Ranges of 80 miles were more than easily able to be achieved, which would have been put at the top of the scan at the U-2 altitude. The U-2 overflights of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were tracked from the very beginning. Lockheed tried a variety of radar foiling measures on the U-2, from radar absorbent foam rubber coatings to networks of antenna wire tuned to specific radar frequencies, but unfortunately none of them actually worked. If nothing else, it convinced Johnson that the only way to achieve true radar invisibility was to design an aircraft that was completely outset for stealth, which is exactly why Lockheed would do with the A-12 SR-71 Blackbird. Now the U-2 can obviously in its modern variant carry a whole host of electronic sensors, infrared or electro-optical devices for instance, mostly used when analysts want to zone in on specific areas. But wet film cameras still outperform other surveillance gear by delivering crisp images well above 70,000 feet, where the pilot can see land from 250 miles in any direction. These cameras can distinguish objects just 8 inches apart, providing sufficient clarity for analysts to read identification numbers on the wing of a parked airplane or count the number of people in a camp, for instance. A typical flight generates a 200 pound, two mile long roll of film, which is shipped specifically by FedEx to Beale Air Force Base. Technicians there then develop the film and analysts search for information that could provide useful for longer term military planning. Given time and staff constraints, however, humans can actually only read about 5% of the images that this spy plane actually captures with the camera. The U-2 had three equally important major components, a light and low drag single seat airframe, an engine that could produce sufficient thrust to keep airborne at extreme altitude, and a camera suite payload that would make the mission worthwhile. Harvard astronomer James Baker designed the U-2's optical systems and lenses and told Johnson that without superb cameras the U-2 was completely pointless and basically just a powered sailplane. Johnson in turn reminded Baker that if Lockheed couldn't keep the gross weight under control, the finest cameras in the world wouldn't be going anywhere anyway. This aircraft was almost a nightmare to fly and the U-2 required extreme finesse in cruise for a margin of airspeed at altitude between stalling and overspeeding called the coffin corner. This was typically only 7 knots and sometimes as little as 4 knots. At 70,000 plus feet, simply turning a U-2 was an incredible feat. Bank just slightly too steep and the inside wing would stall while the outside wing went through never exceeding speeds. Either a stall or busting maximum Mach would almost certainly lead to the airplane shedding its wings or, even worse, just totally exploding. The wings were bolted to the fuselage like a sailplane without a through spar and they were ribless which means it's one of the reasons why it's so light and fragile. On some parts of the fuselage, the skinning was literally the thickness of three sheets of printer paper. U-2 pilots wore the world's first spacesuits, and they were both pioneering and imperfect. Initially made of unyielding rubberized fabric, those partial pressure suits created rubbing points all over the pilot's body, partially on the neck where the helmet attached the suit. Since every high altitude mission required an hour and a half of pre-breathing pure oxygen to purge the body of nitrogen, a U-2 pilot could easily spend 12 hours totally sealed in his suit and helmet. The suits had no provisions for urinating, defecating, so some pilots actually wore diapers, while others used a catheter. The suits were improved and for today are far more comfortable than the full pressure suits of back in then. The U-2 fuel also is a huge problem for this aircraft. Ordinary jet fuel would actually boil off and evaporate at the U-2's extreme altitude. So Kelly Johnson called on his friend Jimmy Doolittle, who had become a vice president of the Shell Oil Company. Doolittle committed to developing a low volatility, low vapor pressure fuel that smelled like lighter fluid. Lockheed consequently designated the LF-1 Alpha. A small number of U-2s were fitted with an aerial refueling receptacle. Air-to-air -air gassing was tried, sometimes with disastrous results. 
It's one thing to manoeuvre a 9G fighter into the trail behind a tanker, but the U-2 was stressed to only 2.5 positive Gs, so even the briefest encounter with the KC-135's wingtip vortices would actually cause it to completely tear apart. The U-2 is actually the only US military aircraft to enter reproduction, which happened in the mid-1960s after 40 of the original 55 U-2s had been lost to accidents and shootdowns. This has been a real, real detrimental effect to the U-2 program. But luckily, Johnson was very careful when it was actually squaring away the design of this aircraft, to the point that all the jigs in the warehouse when they had to produce new U-2s were ready to go, and he was ready to fire up the Skunk Works production line again almost instantaneously. Those U-2s that are currently in operation can carry three times as much reconnaissance equipment and fly nearly twice as far as the other U-2s built in back in the day. In recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Dragon Lady has been used as aerial eavesdropping devices where it could survey dirt patterns to look for signs of makeshift mines, improvised explosive devices, and other trackable items. The aircraft has also shown versatility as a non-military aircraft, as I mentioned before, and as noted by Lockheed Martin has morphed into everything a high-tech NASA platform is needed for conducting physics experiments and high-altitude tool and tracking migration of destructive spruce bark beetles through the forests of Alaska. While the U-2 has to fend off possible replacements, including those from drones, it seems like the Dragon Lady today will continue to spread her wings and keep flying for the foreseeable future. And to me, that makes me quite happy. The mere fact that the aircraft has had many incidences is quite a dark history point for this aircraft. I have to admit, when you know of something that is so intricate like this, it's bound to happen. You're literally trying to defy physics and, you know, the law of gravity and drag and everything else that aircrafts are trying to fight. This thing really is trying to do something completely unparalleled in the world of aviation. But it did it, and it did it pretty good. And yes, there may be a time where this really needs to step aside and, you know, drones may be the future, especially trying to put a pilot up there. Why would you sacrifice the lives of pilots where, you know, drones can do this kind of thing potentially faster, better and longer? I hope you enjoyed learning about the beautiful Dragon Lady today and her elegant long black wings rolling all over this uh, runway here before she scrapes all over the floor. It's a really interesting aircraft, it truly is. It's just like the SR-71 Blackbird, which I definitely will be uh, researching more up into the future. Please let me know if you enjoyed today's video. I would really appreciate also if you can check out the description box below for all my social media links, including that of Patreon and PayPal. Thank you so much to everyone who has been supporting me on there. It truly does mean the world to me. And if you did enjoy today's video, please make sure you click that little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of when I bring out new content in the future. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful and safe day. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye.